Welcome all. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, my good friend, Dr. Sham, and also Dr. Bhavani for organizing such a wonderful event. If anybody talks about diabetes affecting any organ in the heart, in the body, the first organ which will always come is heart because the severity of the problem is already there and then diabetes makes heart diseases even worse. I invite my good friend, Dr. Gokul Reddy, to give the first uh, lecture, the guideline directed medical therapy for heart failure with reduced eje ejection fraction in patients with diabetes, the gold heart. Dr. Gokul is a good friend. We have worked uh, as colleagues in care. He's an interventional cardiologist interested in diagnosing and managing patients presenting with chest pain. He has an experience over, of over 15 years and has performed several thousand cardiac interventions. He's particularly interested in managing patients with heart failure, aortic diseases, and pulmonary hypertension. But more importantly, he is the founder director of one of the largest cardiology and cardiac surgery group practices, FACTS, as we call it, cardiology professionals in Hyderabad. I welcome Gokul. Today I will be discussing quite briefly, pre-lunch session, about the interplay of diabetes in patients with HFREF, that is heart failure, reduced EF, we call HFREF as a short form. I would uh, be happy if it's more interactive because you are experts in managing diabetes and probably this forum where we can actually exchange ideas about how best we can offer the cardiac solutions also. So as a prelude to the discussion, I would present only two cases just to stimulate some discussion. Before, the, before that, I would just spend a few minutes on a slide just to understand how the diabetes affects the cardiac function. We all know diabetes leads to altered uh, free fat metabolism, increased myocardial calcium sensitivity, microvascular dysfunction, RAS alteration, uh, autonomic dysfunction, and uh, direct uh, glucotoxicity. All these together lead to uh, something called LV dysfunction. Uh, we have a lot of factors in which there's a fibrosis, there's a myocardial necro necrosis, there's endothelial dysfunction, there's altered metabolism, there's hypertrophy. These lead to cardiomyopathy. Uh, in simple terms, a heart uh, ejection fraction comes down. And that leads to heart failure. And uh, interestingly, the heart failure again lead to increasing the insulin resistance the cycle. Your heart failure, the worsening the diabetes control, which again leads to a dysfunction, again heart failure. And another slide just to understand that this is very important. A patient with a heart failure, if he develops diabetes, he fares worse. And similarly, vice versa, a diabetic patient who has heart failure fares worse again. So the reason we understand these two are not a very good uh, factors to have uh, together. So we'll go to the case one. It's a routine patient what usually present to a physician or a cardiologist. A middle-aged man comes with a breathlessness, tiredness, swelling of feet. On examination, typically has a normal renal function, a BNP is elevated, a EF of 24%. It's a classical heart failure with a reduced uh, EF or HFREF. This kind of patients, before we go into it, every patient what we strongly believe who comes to you with a LV dysfunction should have assessment for a reversible factor. The reason is, it's not very uncommon for us to see patients who have been treated for years together with a label of DCMP. And when we evaluate a couple of years, we find that he has a non reversible with artery. So very important for us to identify patients who have a reversible cause of LV dysfunction. Like a diabetic patient, even non-diabetic, somebody has a triple disease or a proximal disease or left pain, they can have LV dysfunction. These kind of patients, if you revascularize, the LV function improves dramatically and patient is off the shelf of heart failure at all. So these slides would point to the patients in whom the angio is done, it's normal, or the angio is done and the artery is sort of cleared, is revascularized by the PTC or CABG, and still he has a reduced EF. So unless until we evaluate for the reversible factor, we should not uh, uh, leave the evaluation there. So, Typically, whenever we have a patient with a heart failure or HFREF, the first thing what we are supposed to do when he comes to the de decompensated is to start diuretics and ACE inhibitors. And a ARNI, in fact, ARNI is the first approach now. The most recent guidelines say that ARNI is the drug of choice. In case patient is, can't afford ARNI or a situation where ARNI is not available, 
then probably you should uh, try to start a AC numbers ARV. Otherwise, RNE is the drug of choice. So when patient comes to the clinic first, he should be on diuretics and RNE, probably investigate and wait for a couple of days. Once he's stabilized, then probably we'll increase the, we start the beta blocker. Beta blocker should be started only when the heart flow is compensated. Compensated means he doesn't have a raised JVP, lungs are clear, there's no S3. If we start beta blocker in a patient who is decompensated, like J, raised JVP, has an S3, has pilarima, actually we, we can worsen him and we may actually he has his hospitalization. So, though these three are very important, the RAS system, the beta blocker, diuretics, these should be started stage-wise, beta blocker, after a slight stabilization of the heart failure. Once the patient is on these three drugs, and one more important point I would like to mention is, when we start a patient on RNA, we should again uh, call back the patient after a couple of weeks to check the creatinine and also the blood pressure levels. And it is very prudent to start as low as possible. As practice, we start 50 milligrams. In fact, the guidelines say 100, but as a routine, we start 50 milligrams twice daily, wait for a couple of weeks, check the creatinine potassium. If they are stable and blood pressure is beyond 110, we increase to 100. And again, two weeks, if it is beyond 110 blood pressure, we increase to 150 and 200. So typically the guidelines say 100, 200, but we are comfortable giving 50, 100, 100, 200, or slowly escalating period of eight weeks. And in our practice, almost like 50 to 60 percent of them reach the 150 milligrams twice daily. Only very few people, less than 10 percent, might reach 200 mg twice daily, which is a recommended dose as per the trials. But a lot of patients are on 50 to 100. So once we are uh, through the initial three drugs, like we stabilized the RNA, we started beta blockers of sufficient doses, we started diuretics. Then what? Then the first thing what we are supposed to do is whether we can start uh, uh, aldosterone antagonists because this is one group of drug which has proven to improve the mortality. But the only caveat is uh, when we, before we start this group of medicines in a patient already in RNA, there's a risk of hyper, uh, hyperkalemia. So we should uh, check creatinine. The guidelines say if the creatinine is beyond less than 2.5 for a male or less than 2 for a lady, you can start uh, spinal lactone provided you have a, you don't have a hyperkalemia. And after the starting of uh, aldosterone antagonists, the next thing what we do is SGLT inhibitors. One more interesting point about SGLT is, it's a good drug. The, if you start SGLT without checking, actually go for dehydration, the low blood pressure, then we are forced to stop the other drugs. So it is wise to decrease your dose of diuretics before we jump on to start the SGLT in full doses. So probably if it's uolemic, I would suggest to slightly de-escalate the diuretics and start SGLT inhibitors. Then, wow, well, usually most of the patients are okay by this stage. Few patients who are not okay, still has uh, uh, volume overload, then we think of starting another diuretics, hoping that the existing uh, diuretics are not working. The diuretic, what we generally use in practice is metalazone. We usually start at small dose, 2.5 milligrams. But specifically, if they are on adequate dose of loop diuretics, plus RNA, plus beta blockers, and mRNA inhibitors, then, uh, the, then still your uh, heart failure is not controlled or patients are still uh, hypervolemic, we start uh, diuretics as an add-on therapy. But when we start metalazone, it's a very powerful diuretic. We should be very careful in checking the potassium very frequently. We have so many number of patients in whom we start metalazone, couple of weeks they are lost, and probably if they come late, they come with hyponatrium and severe hypokalemia. And uh, they, they have very odd patients in whom the, we can't start RNA or patients who can't afford RNA or in patients whom the blood pressure doesn't permit us to start RNA. These kind of patients, usually we go with a combination of hydrolysine and a nitrates. So it's available as isolazine by the company. But uh, this again is a drug, with not a uh, stage one. Probably we should uh, try starting this if we are not able to start RNA because of reason. And uh, then ibabradin, which is actually used more nowadays, but we strongly suggest to reserve the medication for patients in whom the beta blocker cannot be st started and the heart rate is still ele elevated, number one. Number two, in spite of using appropriate dose of beta blocker, your heart rate is not normal. Suppose somebody is already on a metaprolol of 25 milligrams twice daily, and you don't want to jack up the dose because of heart failure, and the heart rate is still 110. Probably these kind of patients, we are comfortable starting ibabradin. So, one more interesting uh, thing is digoxin is missed here. Digoxin has a very limited role nowadays. We usually give digoxin in patients who have elevated dysfunction with the AF with heart rate. Probably that's the only situation where we use digoxin, nothing else. Heart failure, decompensated, atrial fibrillation with a very fast heart rate. And we have very limited choice with the drugs. So the, what the consensus say, this point I just want to stress. Previously, we used to start ARB, wait for two weeks, then change to RNA. 
but the recent guidelines say that probably RNA first approach is the right one. Whenever we have a patient heart failure, provided you have a renal function of normal GFR within normal limits, probably first is to start RNA and diuretics. So RNA in our practice in the last three, four years, what we noticed is patients who are directly on RNA tend to do better. The quality of life, we are always perplexed with this. The patients who are on RNA generally say they are doing well. We don't know what happens, but their feeling of well-being, their quality of life improves. And similarly, their work capacity or work uh, physical, physical functioning is also much better. And one more interesting point, uh, cardiac reverse remodeling, we are seeing this past three, four years, the moment uh, RNA came into the picture, Prior to RNA, usually we used to monitor the heart function. It used to remain stable. Like somebody is on Enlapril of 10 grams twice daily, heart function 35%, LV size of 6 by 4.5 used to be same or slightly worsen. But with the onset of RNA, what we are seeing in the last three, four years is the heart function actually is improving. The LV size are actually coming down. There is data also. And consequent to this data, there is a new guideline came by the ACC saying that if you have a patient in whom the heart function improved from 30% to 40%, Really, we don't have an idea whether to stop the RNA or not, not to stop. The current consensus is to continue the RNA because we don't know what happens if we stop the RNA, probably till the trial comes. And suppose this patient, if he develops a heart failure, develops a diabetes, then what to do? Just a small slide. The diabetes is very common in heart failure. So this, whenever somebody has heart failure, it's very important to have a regular glucose check done. A lot of people we usually we present incidental diabetes. Somebody has a three monthly sugars check, suddenly they come with a higher uh, sugars. So, and one more thing is, uh, whenever these kind of patients have a higher chance of getting hospitalized. Whenever there's a combination of diabetes with heart failure, it's generous deadly combination. So one, just slide for you to understand, we have a common uh, thing, statins lead to diabetes. There's a common notion among diabetes, among the, uh, most of the RP doctors, some patients too, but we tend to impress to them that statins don't cause diabetes, there's significant data. But yes, beta blockers and diuretics do have some effect on the dysglycemia. They do cause decreased control of the blood sugars. And similarly, there have been glitazones or, or uh, I mean, some drugs were implicated previously in the heart failure. You are the experts for those things. Generally, we should keep in mind the drugs which probably can affect the heart failure. And uh, it's prudent to avoid those drugs which can lead to worsening heart failure. So the AD recommendation as of now is to start SGLT inhibitors in this kind of population when there's heart failure because they have a recently shown to have some mortality benefit also. So SGLT inhibitors are currently uh, used as an add-on therapy to the existing uh, guideline-based uh, medication for the diabetes. And one more thing in routine practice is when we start SGLT2, specifically when we escalate the dose, it's important for us to see the concomitant diuretic dose also. What happens is, we, it's not uncommon for us to see a patient who's on three to four diuretics. Then it becomes a mess, the potassium, magnesium, all these lead to a lot of uh, electric disturbances and uh, there's increased chance of sudden cardiac death. A lot of diuretics leads, leads to a lot of loss in potassium and magnesium in the urine. Those lead to arrhythmia. So very important for us to appropriately dose the diuretics. So this is an interesting slide just to uh, see the benefit of uh, starting these drugs in uh, diabetic patients. You can see whether the patient is a diabetic or undiagnosed diabetic or pre-diabetic or a normal blood sugar, all of them, the RNA scores much better than the ACE inhibitors. This, I mean, the, similarly, the quality of life also improves in these patients when we start ACE inhibitors. This uh, has a lot of uh, new drugs, uh, they have a lot of uh, new effects being described. We don't know, but yes, uh, RNA has been uh, shown to reduce the A1C levels, and they say it's probably because of pleiotropic effects of the RNA also. So they, uh, one of the data shows that there's a 30% reduction in the new use of insulin patients who are on RNA. The conclusion is, in these kind of patients, uh, RNA is the first uh, line of therapy, and probably when the diabetes uh, starts, they should be on SGLT2 in as add-on therapy. And uh, this is the first patient was a patient with a heart failure getting a diabetic. Now we have the vice versa. The patient who is uh, diabetic figures heart failure. A diabetic patient, uh, uh, suppose he, you are the best probably just one slide to say that the cardiologists agree with the metformin. We are very comfortable with using metformin in patients with diabetes. In fact, in, fact, in patients with heart failure also, we don't stop metformin unless until there's a creatinine issue. So still the drug of choice uh, as per the ADA is metformin. 
And if this patient, after a couple of years, complains of breathlessness, swelling of feet, getting tired, and signs of heart failure, probably these kind of patients develop heart failure. So just a slide to understand what is the risk of diabetes. There is a two to full risk, increased risk of heart failure patients with diabetes compared to those without diabetes. Diabetes also is an important predictor for symptomatic heart failure in patients who don't have any symptoms with elevated dysfunction. And the risk of heart failure is higher even in patients who have borderline diabetes. So this is the same thing like what I spoke previously. Even patient, these patients are also the first of drug choices, ARNI. So this is a trial, the evaluate heart failure, which actually showed that the eco really improves after 12 weeks. We saw after three, six months, a lot of patients have a better LVEF. So the data is when somebody, it's a common question for us, when somebody has an improved heart function, please continue the RNA, don't stop them because still we don't know what happens to patients if we stop the RNA. So this uh, last step probably to just to show that the mortality benefit when you combine the drugs. When we combine the RNA with a beta blocker and an uh, aldosterone antagonist, the 63% is the mortality reduction. And similarly, when you compare with only AC inhibitors, it's only 70% which is not significant. So that's the incremental benefit of RNA when you combine with a beta blocker and uh, aldosterone antagonist. So I think, uh, yeah, a conclusion would be in a patient with diabetics and then develops a heart failure, metformin is still drug of first choice. The RNA is still drug of first choice for the HFREF. And as SGL2 inhibitors with metformin or replace metformin if there's a contraindication would be the better glycemic choice. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gokul. If you could just wait for a couple of minutes, we'll take questions. Uh, thank you, Gokul, for a very in-depth and very clear and concise uh, message and also presentation. L let me just ask a couple of questions, uh, just a statement. Uh, the angiotensin receptor inhibitors, most of us will know this as Vimada or uh, Asmada as in Indian market, have made a sea change in treatment of heart failure patients. As a personal experience, I'll tell you, I had two patients who were referred to me for heart transplantation. This is now about six to eight months ago. We admitted the patients, started them under cardiology care. We started them on these agents. You have to start them slow, isn't it? You start them at 50 and That's then true. increase it up to 100. And then if blood pressure allows, go up to 200. These two patients are now different people from a stage wherein they couldn't come from the main reception to my clinic, now they are having a almost normal life. They can do their daily activities. That is what I'm saying by normal life. So these drugs makes a difference. So that's a comment. Question to you, first question before I throw it open. Which are the patients in which you will not use these drugs? Yeah. And in diabetics, are there situations wherein you would not use these drugs as a first line agent? That was my question. Yes, but uh, diabetes doesn't uh, change the yeah. uh, prescription patterns at all. Yeah. It's drug of first choice. The only condition where we would not be using is the blood pressure. Somebody has a blood pressure of 100 or less. It's very difficult for us to start this medicine because the moment you start medicine, blood pressure drop at 10 to 15, he comes back. So what we see is we try to see what other medicines are there which can drop blood pressure. A lot of these patients are on nicrandyl, uh, nitrates or some of the drugs which can decrease blood pressure. We try to adjust those medicines, we remove them slowly, then start the RNA. As Hemant has rightly said, uh, in the last five years, we have seen so many patients of elevated dysfunction improving to an extent that uh, we are worried, how can uh, patients improve? Then there was a discussion about, uh, probably there was a reversible cause in these kind of patients. There was a big data came in, then they said that no, no, RNA actually, because of decreased afterload, leads to some 10 to 12 percentage points in heart function. But yes, there is no answer how long we should continue the RNA. As long as the current data says that probably continue as long as the next guidelines come in. Yeah, thank you. Any questions from the floor? Regarding beta blocker, <coughs> Concor, Cor, I, I think you yes. must have heard, 2.5 mg. Will, is it useful for stage 2 of diastolic dysfunction. If we increase, will there be any improvement? Yes. A diastole dysfunction grade 2, the drug of uh, choice are the negative inotropic agents. Beta blockers are the perfect choice for negative inotropic agents. They generally work well. 
the RNA doesn't work for uh, normal heart function or it has dysfunction. The next drug what is supposed to work is SGL2 inhibitors. They work for uh, diastolic heart dysfunction also. So beta blocker, right, that works for it. Concor is a good beta blocker, works for negative antioxidant, improves the diastolic function. Yes, it usually go till the blood pressure is adjusted. The problem is diastolic heart release, you should have a less of the afterload. The higher the afterload, the higher the diastolic dysfunction. The blood pressure has to be controlled. Not of the drug, the blood pressure has to be controlled. If the blood pressure is controlled with the beta blocker, probably the diastolic function is the best. Madam, can it be a quick question because we are running behind? Please. Thank you. Four patients, uh, they are HFRF patients uh, post PTCA and therefore discharge stable patients and they suddenly have a syncope or seizure kind of episode. So my question is, uh, am I missing something or is there something I could do to prevent such episodes? Yeah, good question. When we have these patients who have an angioplasty done and pre discharge syncope, the commonest reason is the nitrous or drug which leads to postural drop in blood pressure. These patients are not used to medication previously. The moment we start nitrates, peripheral vasodilating agents, there's a lot of uh, venous pooling. So suddenly they get up or discharge, they have syncope. Not very uncommon. The other thing what we are supposed not to miss is the arrhythmias. Whenever somebody has a heart attack, the first one month is the period where when somebody has a dysfunction, there's a slightly higher chance of getting a arrhythmic issues. So somebody has syncope, we default ask them to check the electrolytes and possible go back into check the rhythm, whether we, are, we have a lot of ectopy or high risk 